Right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our next panel here in the theatre at MCM Comic Con in Scotland. Please join me in giving a massive round of applause to the person who will be guiding you through this next panel. Please join me in giving a massive round of applause from LGBU Scotland, Adam. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, this is LGBT Youth Scotland's first ever uh, session at Comic Con. Um, I'm really glad you're here to experience that with us. Uh, so my name's Adam. Um, I work in communications, fundraising, and campaigning for LGBT Youth Scotland. Um, and I've been a gamer ever since I was 10 years old playing The Secret of Monkey Island on my dad's work computer, which he could only get home like maybe once a week. Um, it was, uh, so our organization is the National Charity for LGBTI Young People around Scotland, um, and this is our 30th anniversary year. Um, first and foremost, we are a youth work charity, um, so we run youth groups across the country. Um, we also run a digital youth work service, which uh, allows people that can't get along to our youth groups to connect with um, trained youth workers uh, for advice and support. Um, so one of the things that we want to do as an organization in the next couple of years is to really innovate in uh, digital youth work, um, which is kind of quite an underexplored um, area in Scotland at the moment. Um, and one of the elements of that is gaming. Um, so if you were lucky enough to take part in uh, my colleague Craig's workshop upstairs earlier, you'll have got a flavor of some of the things that we're wanting to explore uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so this afternoon, I've brought together uh, some of the most interesting people that I know um, to talk about the experiences that we've had as LGBTQ gamers, some stuff about the state of the industry now, and generally to share our thoughts and opinions about the future um, of the industry and what we should aspire to as developers and as gamers. Um, so we're gonna begin today's panel the same way that we do in LGBTQ Scotland youth groups which is we're gonna introduce our names, our pronouns, a little bit about what we do, and we're also gonna uh, volunteer a fact, and today's fact is, in your lifetime, which game most struck a chord with your identity as an LGBTQ gamer? Okay, so I'm gonna kick off. So I'm Adam Knight, uh, I use he, him pr pronouns, and my most profound connection with a game was The Sims when I was growing up. So I uh, remember like really strongly this like nervous energy that I had um, as a kid designing my like dream uh, life for uh, an out and proud gay character. Um, and I remember like being really worried that one of my parents was gonna walk in at any point and that I'd have to like quickly close down the game. Um, so yeah, that had quite a big impact on me. Um, I think it, because it was, in a way I was sort of role-playing happiness at a time when a lot of people were telling me that I was going to be unhappy. Um, so I'm going to pass over to my left here. Uh, hi, my name is Matt. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I work at a company called Six to Start, which makes a game called Zombies Run. And I think the most impactful game, uh, not really an individual game I can remember, but the early days of kind of like uh, Fallout uh, RPGs and uh, the early Elder Scrolls games where there were options for romance that you could kind of freelance depending on what your thought was. And those were kind of my first experiments into kind of like, maybe I could like guys as well. And that was kind of uh, a, a, a quite a, it was like touching the third rail on a train track, I suppose. And there was a lot of power there that I discovered accidentally almost. Hey, I'm Steve. Uh, I am a researcher and a writer and a lecturer, so I work at the University of Glasgow, and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, the game is playing the Fable series, and I think realizing uh, early on, kind of being quite delighted in the game that you could romance or marry who you wanted, or a really wide range of people, and for it to be not a big deal, and also for it to be really stupidly funny. It wasn't serious, it wasn't kind of loaded with huge amounts of importance and, and anxiety. It was just there. Yeah, it was just there. John, 
Okay, there we go. Uh, so I'm Shay Thompson. I'm a presenter and host working in the games industry. Um, I like work for BAFTA and McLaren. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, thinking about a video game that had a profound effect on me as a bisexual woman, I think it was Dragon Age 2. Um, Isabella, I love that game so much. Isabella was, um, yeah, just like absolute goals, really unapologetic about her sexuality. And every single time I had to, um, like, do a playthrough, um, it was a very tough choice between romancing her or Fenris. Um, very, very difficult, but yeah, very, very influential for me. Uh, my name is uh, CJ Quigley, and uh, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, and I'm the MSYP, which is the member of Scottish Youth Parliament for LGBT Youth Scotland. And also, I'm a youth worker for Glasgow Life. Uh, probably the most influential game for me is uh, Mass Effect, because as someone who is both bi and trans, getting to play as a female in a game when I couldn't be female quite yet myself was amazing. And then also getting to romance however I wanted, whether it be male or female, was one of the greatest things ever and it kind of put my dysphoria to the side while I was growing up, which was amazing. Thank you so much. Please welcome our amazing panel. Okay, so we're going to kick off by doing a little icebreaker. This is something that we do at LGBT Youth Scotland all the time. Um, so what I'm going to do is when I count you in, we're going to all start quietly applauding around the room, OK? And uh, I'm going to show you a quick fire selection of 14 characters. These are LGBTQ characters in games. And I want you to applaud louder when you spot the ones that you identify with, that you have connected with, that you care about the most. Um, obviously, if there are any that you don't know, then your silence will speak volumes. Um, but yeah, I, I want to hear some whooping and cheering, because there's some beloved characters up here, and some less so. Okay, so we're going to start the applause just now, please. Just gentle applause. And here goes. Okay, that was very interesting, thank you. Um, big applause for Sarah there. Why do we think that is from Dragon Age? I think, I think again, it's like how unapologetic she is. I think one of my concerns sometimes with um, representation is, you know, we talk about things being like shoehorned in, but actually things just existing and being normalized is actually the way to go with stuff and I think her character kind of speaks to that. I don't actually like Dragon Age Inquisition that much. Controversially, I do think Dragon Age 2 is the best in the series, but um, no, I did really like her character. Were there any characters that our panel here particularly connected with? I noticed there was a couple that you were applauding to that maybe the audience didn't know or hadn't really connected with. I'll, I'll admit that I applauded Juhani from uh, Knights of the Old Republic, having very, very powerful memories of playing the entire game but not having a very detailed uh, remembrance of the storyline in particular. But I remember that being a very uh, powerful sense of um, narrative control, which was quite unusual at the time. So um, if you haven't played KOTOR, go back and give it a go. It's a very, uh, very interesting game. I second that. Uh, Gone Home was on the list. Yeah, so it was Gone Home was the one that uh, kind of jumped out for me as just a really subtle game and it's not a game which has a huge amount of kind of 
gameplay mechanics, kind of action game. Those of you who played it, it's really a game which involves you walking through an empty house trying to find out what happened to your family while you've been away at college. And during the course of it, you find out something about your own history and something about how your little sister has kind of grown up. And it's just really gorgeous and subtle and trusts you as a player with a lot of, I guess, emotional intelligence. It's just a really nicely made game. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the thing that uh, with Gone Home for me was that I was expecting a kind of um, traditional, I, I don't know, I had expe expectations for like some horror element to be there, something supernatural, something shocking. And actually what I got was like a really heartfelt human story. And therefore, by the time I finished it, I, I cried for about half an hour because um, I just wasn't expecting that emotional resonance. Um, did we have any strong feelings about Soldier 76? Because for me, I almost feel like there's a sort of Dumbledore quality to making Soldier 76. What, what's a Dumbledore quality, please? Perhaps the idea that um, it maybe wasn't when the character was created, uh, perhaps uh, it wasn't in the creator's minds that he would end up being gay. How do we feel about developers sort of retconning their characters in that way? I think it can be validating at times. Um, you know, if you kind of have feelings or assumptions about a character, and then you find out that actually those assumptions are true, it's kind of like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, when, I say when as well, when Aloy comes out as being bi, I'm like, okay, cool, that makes sense. I don't know necessarily if um, that was like the right move um, for Overwatch, just because I think Blizzard in the past has like kind of dropped the ball with some of their diversity and representation. So uh, for me personally, it didn't come across as genuine, but I know other people might have had other feelings towards it. Um. What, what were your observations around Overwatch dropping the ball? Um, is there anything that really sticks out for you? For me, again, personally, the fact that they haven't had like a black female character in that game is it's kind of, and every time they come up with the excuses, it's, it just doesn't feel like it's good enough. Um, especially seeing like the, um, I think the concept art for Mercy, I think she was originally drawn as like, black guy and like seeing the concept art for Ash, like she was originally a woman of color. It's just, I don't know, like s sometimes with Blizzard, it feels kind of hollow. And I know they've got issues reaching back to some of their older games too. Um, so we're gonna, let's take this back to basics, shall we? Um, so let's think about what it means to be reflected in the art that we consume. Um, so, uh, I'm going to come to you, Steve. What do you think that means for people? Um, do you think there's um, this is a, a goal that developers should strive for? What does it mean for a person to be able to see themselves reflected in the art that they're consuming? I guess there's two different things there. The question of whether it's something developers should strive for, maybe to come back to that, because developers are artists, and artists have lots of different opinions about what they do with their work. So we'll come back to that. In terms of what it means to be represented, or to find representation of something, I think it's about an act of inclusion which says, the default setting of the universe has you in it. It's about saying, I don't need to ask for extra permission to be here. I don't have to ask for an accommodation to be made. I'm just part of the default setting of the universe. I was already here before I turned the game on. And then I find myself in the game, and I'm here again when the game is done. It's about the default settings for the universe. I was talking to someone about this the other day, and we were talking about like what's the how far does that metaphor stretch? And we were talking about like the default setting of going inverted controllers. Like when you pick up someone else's controller and they have left poor settings, or the the, the something about that has been changed. But even then, there is an assumption at the level of the coding that that is a valid option. That is something that people will actually want to pick up and use. And maybe it's like a far too stretched metaphor, but it is about the default settings of the universe. And it's about knowing that you are that you have a place in it, and that no one has to ask permission. Do you have something to add to that, Matt? I, I do. Yeah, actually, I think um, you make really good points, Steve, about uh, re reflecting people's existence in the art that they can see. But I actually think uh, representation of uh, well, representation uh, in games and in other media 
Um, I like to think of it more as a tool than as an aim in itself. And I think that there are sort of two key purposes to representation. And there's one that speaks to uh, individuals from underrepresented communities uh, directly. And they say, you are valid. We recognize you. We see your stories. We see your pain. We see your life. And we want to reflect that back at you. But there is also a purpose in representation, which is creating a more safe world for those people to exist in outside of the culture. So um, it, it, it's, I, I hope it's not a, a, a fact we will argue about that uh, culture can define society. And when we see people uh, in culture that we don't necessarily, that we're not necessarily aware of around us, uh, our minds can change about people uh, like that. And therefore, I think representation isn't just about the person that it is directly mirroring. It's about uh, making the, the, the world around them a, a better and more habitable and more safe place, basically. Um. You could uh, quite easily um, apply these questions to any other artistic medium as well, couldn't you? Um, from film, TV. Um, and does it feel like the gaming industry is moving a little more slowly um, in the march towards more diversity of representation? Um, I mean, there, there's statistics like, for example, um, women in development positions at the moment, it's currently around 20%, um, which is quite a startlingly low percentage. Um, do you think there's reasons why maybe the gaming industry might be a wee bit behind cinema or TV? Uh, I work in the games industry, I can kind of speak to that. I think um, it, it's it's good old institutional bias and, and systemic uh, oppression, basically. Um, it, people hire uh, people they think are like them, usually. Um, so there's a lot of bias in uh, hiring that uh, puts up horrible barriers to people who aren't uh, cisgendered, straight white guys who maybe like sports as well as games and uh, want to shoot a lot of things. Um, and it actually takes a lot of effort for people to overcome those biases. and. Um, there isn't a lot of a push on the industry to do that um, because the games they make sell very well, and that's the, the law of the land. Um, at, so therefore, the industry hasn't yet um, made a very concerted effort to acquire the skills to overcome internalized biases, um, which leads to massive underrepresentation of women, of uh, trans people, of gay people, of people of all different um, stripes, um, <clears throat> which means that then the experience isn't in the room to make the games that reflect those experiences. Um, it's a, a self-feeding cycle almost. Thank you, Matt. Anyone got anything to add? Yeah. I think it's, my sense is that it's not just that we can say, oh, the, the games industry is lagging behind. I feel like it's just uneven progress. There are some companies, there are some studios, some makers who've been quietly plugging away for decades making diverse games which reflect the diversity both of their fan bases and their communities, and also the, the people in the room making the games. I think it's just uneven. I think that maybe, and I don't want to reduce this to like mainstream versus indie studios, I think it is there are some behemoth companies which are going to carry on making the same kind of games where there's no need for them to change because they make so much money from churning out the same game but with a different year date attached to the end of it. And there are other companies which just have a different creative and creative vision, from, frankly, a different business model. So I think it's uneven progress for a bunch of different reasons. On that topic of like it being uneven progress, like because I'm not a dev, I'm not smart enough to be a dev, um, I just talk about games. Like on that front, games traditionally have only been marketed towards a certain demographic. So it meant that the people who felt comfortable enough talking about games were, for the longest time, cis, straight, white guys. Um, that's changing, but like still very, very slowly. There are only two black female presenters in the UK for games. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> like, there aren't very many of us at all. So yeah, I think it's sort of challenging like how we like, not only make games, but how we market them, market them, how we talk about them as well. I was really struck when I was in London recently to see this enormous billboard advertising Gears 5. And um, there was Kate, the main character, wasn't on it. It was horrifying to me. <laughs> um, OK, we're going to talk a little bit about communities. Um, so obviously, uh, 
if we think about maybe my generation, um, I certainly found that um, queer communities and gamer communities very rarely overlapped and were sometimes almost at odds with each other. Um, and I think often it led to people feeling like they were an outsider in both worlds. Um, I don't know if I've seen nodding over here. CJ, you're a wee bit younger. Um, is that, do you think that's still the case? Um, what's your experience? Uh, I don't think not so much anymore. I think that uh, both, like the gaming community is still very toxic in terms of, especially online. Uh, and you st I still get a lot of abuse online if I play games, so I tend to not have like, mics or anything because uh, people will, yeah, call me not nice things. Uh, but in terms of, uh, say, the gaming community on like Reddit, for example, talking about a game, they tend to be very nice. There's loads of different uh, like uh, communities on uh, Reddit and stuff like that that are for uh, LGBT gamers. And, uh, and it's some of the friendliest communities I've been a part of. And I think that because uh, there is more LGBT characters in gaming, people are starting to be more sort of, yeah, like, uh, I can't think of the word. They're starting to, you know, open their mind to like the fact that, oh, it's not, they're not bad people. Thank you. Um, Shay, you, you work to bring people together from uh, communities as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit about Level Up, Link Up? Um, so yeah, like it's basically like a monthly event um, that I run to try and get like more diversity across the board. Um, I mean, it like specifically focuses on like people of color, but like even within that, there are loads of different intersection intersectional identities. That's the phrase I was looking for. Um, yeah, and like I found that actually, I think maybe back in the day, the two might have been mutually exclusive, but I'm finding now that games and like games communities are way queerer than I initially imagined. And yeah, like my team at work, you know, we're a very, very queer group. It's like really, I was gonna say really funny, but actually it's not funny. Like it's nice to just have my identity be validated and encouraged um, on a daily basis, yeah. Great, anything to add guys? Only that maybe, I think there was a dynamic where the gaming community has been slow to recognize its own diversity because a small number of very loud people have tried to police who gets to identify as a gamer. Where actually, even if we took like this room as a sample, <laughs> looking around at the sheer spectacular of human shape and form that might identify as a gamer is like, we can't pretend that gaming is a narrow community. I think though, there have been some dominant voices which have tried to claim gaming for themselves. And I know that's partly to do with the fact that gaming has become a far broader pursuit, a more mainstream thing. And so there is a kind of sense of maybe anxiety, which is about this thing that was mine and was part of my identity is now having to be shared with a huge number of other people. But it always was shared with a huge range of other diverse people. And you don't have to be threatened by that. And I guess I'm, I've got all the security saying that as the kind of cis white educated dude, but no one's taking gaming away from anyone. Great. Um, so uh, I want to think a little bit about the idea that in the absence of um, uh, a lot of queer characters in gaming, one of the things that we've done, I'm presuming, I certainly have myself, is inserting queerness into your gaming experience in your own ways. So I, I spoke a little bit about The Sims being an example of me doing that. Um, is, there, is there something of a, a rite of passage for younger queer people um, when they begin to sort of experiment and play queer. So I, I know as an example, you, Steve, wrote um, a thesis, is that how you describe it? Uh, it was an article, it was an, an article, article for a journal, yeah. Um, what, what is playing queer and how, how far can we play queer in games as they stand? Um, the kind of, the thing that I wrote about was uh, about uh, the Dragon Age series and um, was uh, about the Fable series. And it was trying to work out where the game was sort of giving license to you as a player to identify or experiment with a kind of queer identity or an, a not strictly straight identity. And so 
it sort of began from recognition that we can read our meaning into pretty much any cultural object, yeah? That even if there isn't an explicit content in a given film or book or play or video game, that we bring ourselves to it regardless, yeah? And that we tend to mirror ourselves through the culture we consume. This is a very human thing that we do. But at the same time, there are decisions that game designers can make which lead us in certain directions. So it's this idea in game design, and Matt maybe can speak to this, this idea of affordance, a sort of an allowance. So when we talk about the affordance of a door handle, it's the shape which suggests that our hand goes round it. So when we talk about affordance in game design, it's about kind of going, where are these opportunities which are built in, which allow us to, to play queer and for it to be meaningful. So it's not just the story we're telling ourselves in our head, which is important and valuable, but whether it then has consequence in the game world. And maybe one of the things that's there with games is often it's really, uh, it's like a dynamic which is one of a mirror. So that if you're playing a game, characters by and large won't express romantic interest in you unless you make the first move. It's really, really rare to play a role-playing game where anyone tries to hit on you. Like, we could probably, in this room, name the four or five or six instances where it happens. Most of the time, you have to do all of the work, and that is really unfair. But the rare instances where there are characters that will flirt with you and express same-sex desire, that's even tinier. So it's those moments, I think, which are really, really significant. We want to kind of go, well, why are they so spectacularly rare? And do we need to invest more time and energy into electronic flirting simulators? And I'm here to say yes, absolutely we do. Matt, why are they very rare? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, well, I, 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 have a, I have an opinion kind of on, the, on the question more broadly, actually, um, which is going to come back to that, I think, which is the, um, the, the con concept of affordance you were talking about, Steve, which is giving validation to the things that the players want to do. Um, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because um, you, good game design in a lot of ways is tricking people into thinking they've hacked the game and, in, and that they've discovered a secret and that the, the game is only there for them in that moment, that no one else knows that you can romance a particular character or that you can find a particular place. Um, good game design is hiding the fact that we built that for everybody and, and that it's not just something you discovered. Um, and I think that, that dynamic might be part of why uh, that can be quite powerful as, as a queer person to discover those moments where you are validated because it feels a little bit like you've carved your own space out in that world even though in a lot of cases more modernly that was designed. Um, I think unfortunately what that does do is it leads to um, an unfortunate pattern I've noticed which is that a lot of games go that far and they give you the option to just, hey, sleep with whoever you like or make fan art of whoever you like, and you can pretend that the main character is gay as much as you like. Um, <clears throat> but they never actually um, make any public statements in defense of those identities, or um, rally round when those are questioned by more negative parts of the gaming community. And there's this kind of paper solidarity there, which is um, pr pretending to be an ally uh, by making room for people to find space for themselves without ever actually um, being very open about that and very defensive of that. And I think that's a, yeah, uh, it might be the more negative aspects of the community that will round on anything that is more public in defense that means they are more rare. And I think that's a tragedy because um, in a way I almost feel hoodwinked a lot of the time that um, Games are winning my support without actually supporting me in a lot of ways. So you're, you're head of development at uh, Six to Start, which is a, a smaller but very successful studio. I'm head um, of production, not development. Right, head of production. Um, the, w does the inclusion of like well-rounded, complex LGBTQ characters pose a risk to your franchise? Uh, thankfully, no. Um, we've been uh, very, very, very uh, open about that from the, the beginning of, of the, the making of Zombies Run. Uh, our lead writer is uh, a queer woman. Uh, obviously, I'm bisexual. A lot of our team are queer in various different types of ways. Um, and yeah, we've had from the very first series, um, one of the most emotional plot lines in our first series is um, uh, about a, a woman looking for her wife um, who's gone missing in the apocalypse. Um, and b because we have been 
very firmly um, pro-LGBTQ from the beginning of the game. Um, and we, we put a lot of effort into having an incredibly supportive and welcoming and defensive, in a good way, we go out there to defend our, our, our family, I suppose. Um, because we've done that from the very beginning, we work very, very hard at it. We do not allow toxic discourse into our community. We, we, uh, we, we often joke that we, uh, we're going to build uh, a, a function that lets us ban people from using the game at all if they uh, come and attack us for um, too much of that gay shit in my zombie game. Uh, you can imagine a lot of people in America um, who are survivalists really like the idea of running away from zombies to keep fit and then they uh, they find the big old queer agenda in the middle of it and they, they don't get happy about it. Um, well, funnily yeah. enough, uh, amongst the glowing praise for your inclusion of those characters um, online, I did find one online review that was a little bit disappointed. And they said, this is a quote, in the story, there are plenty of characters in gay or lesbian relationships. No problem with that. But somehow, the couples in heterosexual relationships always seem to die, while those in homosexual relationships thrive. I really like that because it's like it's an upending of this trope that appears in culture all the time. It's known as bury your gays, where gay characters or uh, LGBTQ characters are denied the rights to happiness, basically. Is this something that you deliberately did? Or? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, actually. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't kill any of the characters I wrote, um, but um, the we've been running for eight seasons now, so lots and lots of people have been killed. Um, I, I can't speak to the motivations of the writers, I'm afraid, but uh, I, I'm fairly certain that wouldn't have been the case. It might have just been accidental because we all love all of our various queer characters too much. We don't want to get rid of them. Uh, That's reason enough. Um, cool, just going back to the uh, inserting of queerness into your gaming experience, um, so uh, to CJ, uh, as a trans person, you've told me before that you've used gaming uh, when you were younger to sort of experiment with gender. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your experiences? Uh, yeah, so like as I said about Mass Effect, like any game that had create, like, create a character in it, I would always create a woman. Even before I knew I was trans, it was like, I, was like, I don't know why, but like this is what I want to create. And uh, when I started to realize it, I was like, it would make me feel like sort of, down and depressed when I was like, that I wasn't female. So playing in games like, uh, uh, like Saint Tro and uh, as I said, Mass Effect Dragon Age, where I could make my own character and be whoever I want to be, uh, and have like no limitations, that uh, and it was my choice, was amazing, because then I could live vicariously through my own character and be whoever I wanted to be. Uh, like I said, Central, I would just walk about in that game and pretend that I was just a normal person on the street, a normal woman who could go about her day without, uh, you know, without having to worry about what I worry about. Amazing. I'm sure that's a very widespread thing, actually. Um, I, yeah, so it's, it's this, I'm fascinated by this idea of character creation tools. Um, and I think, and again, that's like, what, what are the choices you can make right at the beginning of the game? Um, what is even legible as a choice for you when you're creating a character right at the start of the game? I, I can't remember which, there was an amazing game, it would be like a good eight years ago now, uh, which was marketing itself on the strength of being like, you, there are about six billion character combinations. And then it kind of came out just before release that they'd had to take women out of the game. And it was kind of like, yeah, six billion characters, but they're all dudes. You've built something which is incredibly powerful and flexible, but it won't stretch as far as to 51% of the, of the planet's human population. So I think it's like what you even imagine as, as a possibility to start with. And I think game companies run sometimes quite hilariously into trouble when they try and add stuff in later on. My favorite example of this is from Star Wars The Old Republic, where, I don't know, it would be second or third expansion, where they added a planet where a gay marriage was possible, but only on that planet. So you could only access the planet if you had a high-level character and had bought that expansion pack. It was literally a planet of the gays. It was a planet-sized closet. And it was coming from a place, presumably, of them going, we want to make our game more inclusive. But 
They literally made it a remote planet on the edge of the universe, which you could only get to through a series of paid-for experiences. And so, though, again, they'd started in the right place, maybe, it ended up looking really stupid. Um, I think that game has been patched and come a long way since then, but it was something, it was a gesture which pleased no one, really. So th the usual people who resist that kind of inclusion were just angry it even existed, and the people who might have benefited, for, benefited from it felt like it was a really hollow gesture. So I think it's those decisions which are made about design right at the beginning, which are, for me, the most significant in then allowing any of us to make space for our, ourselves in them. Shay, do you think there's um, big developers making good decisions currently? Or is this very much like something that's being driven by the indie space and big developers are just kind of slower to move and maybe go where the money is? In a word, yes. Um, I think. I think sometimes what ends up happening is, yeah, like companies will listen and, you know, see that the world is evolving and adapting and changing and want to, you know, adapt with it. I think a good example is like cyberpunk. I know they've like received tons of like, you know, justified flack for some of the choices that they've made um, prior to the game's launch. Um, but I think they said like with their character creator, I, I might have this wrong. I think they said they're taking like gender away, like it's, you know, you're, you are allowed to pick various characteristics. And I think that's a, that's a good step in the right direction. I'm still very like cautious, but I think, it's, I think it's a change that's meaningful and that's more of what we need. Um, in terms of it being a case of like indie versus AAA, I think, I think there is some of that, because like, by nature, a lot of indies are just a lot queerer from the outset. Like a good example, Night in the Woods, like May's character, you know, completely relatable for me for a plethora of reasons but again it was just because it was so normalized and so natural and subtle at, at times um yeah i think more do you think do there's that. an element as well of maybe when big developers do get it right their marketing teams then get it wrong yes <laughs> yeah i think um sorry uh, a lot of the time marketing is a big part of it because obviously you want your games to sell so people can play them I just think with a lot of stuff, we should just let them be. Apex Legends had a great launch because it just came out. I'm like, just let it come out. I don't need to hear all the preamble because <laughs> sometimes that's a lot worse. And that had a, it has a very diverse character set, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly that. Cool, okay, so we're gonna think a little bit about some spheres outside of uh, sort of single player gaming. So um, one of the things that really struck me was that when, uh, I don't know if you remember, H Bomber guy, Harry Bruis, did uh, an enormously successful um, marathon stream fundraiser for the charity Mermaids that supports uh, trans children around the UK. And um, he raised a quarter of a million pounds. Um, to me, I, I noticed a lot of people around me, colleagues, for example, um, they were maybe quite struck by this sort of coming together of the queer and gamer communities. And for them, that was like, uh, that was quite a, an eye opener because they maybe hadn't thought that we'd got that far. Um, and do you think um, maybe that's because it's the streaming culture that they're not tapped into? Has streaming kind of come along um, further than the, the rest of the industry has? I can only speak as a consumer of streams, but um, the thing that always struck me about what's so attractive about watching someone streaming a game is the same thing that I love about listening to a podcast, which is the intimacy. And I think the thing that the best streamers do is that they curate their communities in their channels very, very actively. Uh, and that means that they can uh, enforce and protect a kind of like community environment, which in um, in the case of uh, channels which are uh, very LGBTQ friendly, um, that means that there is a, a, an actively moderated safe place where you can go and be with other people who uh, might match your identity in some way or another. Um, and I think that, that was what struck me when I first started uh, exploring streaming at least. Yeah, I get the feeling that streaming communities kind of grokked on that you have to have really proactive moderation and community support baked right in from the start. Because it's a live experience, you have to kind of prepare for the fact that someone might start 
screaming obscenities on your in your chat window. So you need people there to start with. So I mean, I feel like the people who are either incredibly skilled professionals or incredibly skilled volunteers, the people who are giving their time to moderate like chat rooms on Twitch, I feel like the unsung heroes of the gaming community at the moment, that they make those chat spaces just legible, just readable, never mind affirmative, but just spaces that aren't windows of horror. <laughs> No, I um, so I used to stream for Xbox, and some of the things, some people were very nice, and then some people were not so nice. Um, yeah, mods are generally like the backbone of any streaming community. So, in your experience of doing that, did you were there times where you kind of you could see the chat, and there'd be like one eye twitching, and you'd be like, "I've got to keep it together for because I'm live," or what was it like? <sighs> so it was it was it was rough at times. Like most times. Basically, it was like a marketing channel, so it wasn't. I wasn't necessarily the focus. Um, it was more so about you know making the game look as best as possible. Um, so oftentimes, I'd be playing games that I had no real experience with, and I'd be learning how to play them live, which was fun when you're front page <laughs> on my mixer. Um, so yeah, sometimes I'd like kind of see something and. Badly enough, I am like sort of used to the abuse now, but sometimes every now and then I'd see something and be like, whoa, like, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Like, or with those hands, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was rough um, a lot of the time, but it's fun. Uh, I think in terms of like streaming, it's much better than it is on like stuff like YouTube, because as you said, they're moderators, they can moderate it in real time, and any time a comment pops up, someone reports it in that's them out. I think YouTube is a lot worse because the video is up there forever and people can keep commenting. Uh, I watch, or I used to watch, I don't watch it as much anymore, uh, a bunch of gamers called Achievement Hunter and uh, they had uh, if, if bisexual uh, women of colour uh, joined their uh, group and that woman eventually left because the amount of hate she got on YouTube comments saying that she's uh, all she talks is about is being bisexual and how she's not funny and how she's the worst member of the group and stuff like that and it eventually got her to leave and uh, it's yeah so it's not as great I think on YouTube because you don't have that constant moderators take, looking at every comment and deleting it as it comes in. The, I mean you referred to the fact that you don't really use mics in multiplayer gaming um, before and I, that's something I've heard uh, really widely. So, is the industry beginning to effectively tackle the toxicity of multiplayer gaming at the moment? Are there are is there anything happening to to change the culture in any way? Is it a culture change? Is it a change of mechanics? Uh, I just don't think a lot of people don't report on games uh, anymore. I don't think I don't really report people. It's a Usually it's the own in-game reporting system and it doesn't work uh, great. Uh, but there's nothing really... You, also, you don't... Uh, when you report someone in a game, there is no feedback. You don't understand if your report's actually done anything. You don't know if that person has been banned or been warned or whatever. You just report them and that's it. You don't hear anything about it again. So you just sort of, after a while, you're like, what is the point in going through all this trouble to report someone? and then nothing really get, ever gets done about it. So I don't really think, I just think it's probably the mechanics in the, ga in the games themselves just don't really help in terms of that. So you work in eSports. That's a very white, straight, cis world. <laughs> yeah, so I've yeah, only recently begun like dipping my toe in um, eSports with the work I do with McLaren. And yeah, it very much is that, especially because that's all like um, racing sims. So very technical, you know, if you don't have an interest in cars, like, you know, you're not part of that world. And I find, to be fair, actually, the community has been like really receptive to me stepping into their space and like learning and growing with them. Um, but like one of our videos did like particularly well. And that's when the trolls came pouring in, which was like, really 
uh, again, like I said, unfortunately, I'm used to it. What I will say about esports, though, is that the FGC, so the fighting games community, is incredibly diverse. Like, one of the biggest names, like, in esports period, like, not even just in the FGC, is Sonic Fox, who recently came out as non-binary, I believe, and they are gay. So, you know, seeing, like, a black, gay, non-binary person, like, absolutely dominate uh, fighting games, like, in so many different titles is like absolutely inspirational as you know a button basher <laughs> very cool um i was going to tell you a little story um so I, I do think mechanics design is an is an element of this um and my most like profound experience of this was playing sea of thieves now, i don't know if many of you've played it before but um one of the things I really like about it is that is there are so many little elements and it designs to sort of foster community and uh, encourage good social behavior. Um, and so I managed to convince my uh, colleague, his name is David, um, he's a youth worker. I managed to convince him to start playing Sea of Thieves with me. Um, and this was a year and a half ago. Um, and I used to play with him all the time, and then I began to notice that he didn't play with me quite as much as he used to. And it was because, it was because he'd met, he joined uh, a random team and ended up with these two um, US Navy vets, um, Tim and Eric. Um, and David is quite a flamboyant gay man, to say the least. Um, and he had lived most of his gaming life avoiding multiplayer spaces or at least avoiding voice chat for that reason. Um, and he, over the course of the, the last year and a half, has formed this like very close friendship across the globe with these two guys, these two sort of macho straight guys that had never met a gay guy before. Um, and he tells me the story about like uh, one day he logged on to find the two of them waiting at the port next to their ship with uh, the rainbow flag. Um, which I thought was just the cutest thing in the world. Um, and they said to him, you thanking us for treating you like a human being tells us everything we need to know about how other straight men have treated you. And I just thought it was, it was a really lovely moment. Um, what are, are there other examples of like mechanics being used to promote better behavior of players? Because I, I do feel like there's almost like maybe the issue is not what we've created, maybe it's the, a cultural issue, maybe this is what, you know, a societal issue. Um. Yeah, like unfortunately our hobbies and stuff don't exist in a vacuum, like we do get the trickle down of, you know, our implicit biases, um, which is a huge issue. On the topic of like companies, you know, and their mechanics or lack of mechanics, I think I don't think companies are doing enough to combat um, like harassment in games, I think. Like, especially on the topic of voice comms, like, you know, turning on, you know, voice chat and like Overwatch, for example, you're just instantly, you know, bombarded with a slew of abuse. And, you know, there's no real way to track that. And, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have the answers for it on that side because, like I said, I'm not a dev um, and I can't imagine how much work would go into keeping track of that. But I think also it will take companies actually coming out and saying, explicitly like we don't stand for this kind of abuse in our games like i actually went and looked to see if you know some companies had made statements like this and i didn't find much like especially in the bigger uh, AAA area anyway sorry that i know that doesn't really answer your question but. no that was great thank you um i think what you said about voice chat being toxic is like the, absolutely the worst part of it and one thing that i've only started to see recently, um, and I'm surprised not more people are doing, is giving you ways to play the game successfully without having voice chat. So I'm thinking about something like Apex Legends, having the really, really smartly built ping system that lets you play, like, I don't have a mic just because I like, don't have a microphone. Like I, uh, um, and I've been longing to be able to play a game like uh, Fortnite or Apex Legends in a way that isn't making me a hindrance to the people I play it with. And having a, um, a ping system like in Apex allows you to bypass the toxicity of the voice chat by muting the whole thing while still having this method for interaction. Can you just quickly explain what a oh, ping chat is? Sure, yeah. So the ping system in uh, Apex Legends is you have a hot button on your mouse or wherever. Um, and when you point at something, you press that button, it sends a, a message to your teammates with some information about the thing you're pointing at. 
and it's just very cleverly made so that it always seems to know what you're trying to say. So it, you know, you point it in a general direction, it's going to say something like "enemies over here," uh, or "cool shield in this building," or you know, it, it's just very good at com communicating the information you intend to, uh, which other systems in the past haven't been so, so successful at. So um, things like that that um, do a little bit of an end around the voice chat problem uh, is at least a halfway house to solving the issue. But you're right, the state, the lack of active support from 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 the from the creators is just I mean it's just shocking really like yeah I think it's again it's another place where uh, either the game developers need to take a really active role or the community steps in and take an active role so the game that I'm like sink most of my life into like seven years after release is still Guild Wars which has a fabulously brilliantly welcoming and self-policing community partly because the voice chat systems that are being used, so we use TeamSpeak on my server, is that those are privately run. They are kind of community sp supported, so the community kind of stumps up the money to pay for them. But then the moderators are kind of people in the community. So if there is someone on voice chat who is being abusive, who is being an asshole, they get muted. And if they persist in that behavior, they lose access to TeamSpeak full stop. And the community has just kind of created that work for themselves and has taken on that work and shared it amongst the community. And it means that I don't feel anxious at all about going on to voice chat in that community and never have in a way that only in retrospect I realize is incredibly rare. I haven't had any other kind of gaming community experiences where I know that there are people who are already in that space looking out for each other. And that's what it comes down to. I'm not suggesting here that that takes developers off the hook, but it, it does suggest that other sort of models are possible. It does seem like in the absence of the developers doing yeah. things. We are stepping in as communities to I fill mean, those voids. Maybe it helps the fact that Guild Wars doesn't have voice chat built in. So right from the beginning, we had to invent our own systems if we wanted to talk to each other. And thankfully, right at the start, we also agreed that we wanted to be able to talk to each other in a way that didn't make us want to pour bleach in our eyes afterwards. So, so if, if community is one of the aspects that can kind of uh, counteract the toxicity. Um, I think spaces like uh, Comic Cons, um, like these, are really important because it brings people together in person. Um, I know there are some LGBTQ specific cons in America, uh, as Gamer X, as an example. Um, but I think it's really important that we're also sort of infiltrating these mainstream spaces as well, so I'm really glad that we're here. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. No, again, it's just about like normalizing things, sorry. Uh, sorry, that's not what interrupted you again. Uh, sorry, uh, the, yeah, seeing the amount of pride flags and that on sale and the amount of people walking about with them is amazing. Like, uh, I'm, you already feel great here as a geek, as a gamer, seeing people and, you know, oh my god, that person's dressed up as like a stormtrooper, that's amazing. But then seeing someone with a pride flag, you're like, oh, I'm another part, like another community I'm a part of is here as well. And it's like, I'm like, I'm not the only one that has these two interests. Like, uh, there's lots of other people in the world, and it's amazing seeing that. My feeling, and I'm a painful optimist, my feeling is that. Uh, there have always been queer people here at events like this, and that just now maybe we're a bit more visible and vocal and literally on a platform <laughs> and able to see and hear each other. But I think queer people have always been part of this community, always. Uh, just on that note, we have been invited back for next year, um, which is really good to hear. Um, so, uh, finally, we don't really have time for audience questions, unfortunately, but we're going to wrap up with a final question. Um, so I'm just going to leave this open to you. You don't all have to answer this, but do jump in if you can think of something. So if you had a message to the big developers about what they need to do to move the industry forward, what would it be? I am more queer people and listen to them, for God's sake. Uh, definitely more tra uh, LGBT characters in video games and uh, I think specifically trans characters. There's not a lot of trans characters in video games. 
So, yeah, I think more should be added than them, and then more games with character creation, because then people like me can live vicariously through those characters as well. Uh, take more responsibility, um, hold yourselves accountable, and specifically to Gorilla, who made, um, Gorilla, Gorilla, made Horizon Zero Dawn, make Igaloid bisexual, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's not just being accountable, but also being like, don't be apologetic for the choices that you've made in your art. Like, you've made a thing, you've made choices to make it a good thing that you want people to be playing, stand up for it. Don't apologize. Don't defensively try and frame it in a way that's not going to offend someone. Stand up for your work. You have made a good thing. You want people to enjoy it and have fun. Like, that should be your line. Don't apologize. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, now, all of our panelists here have a presence on Twitter. They're all universally interesting on Twitter. Um, so they really recommend you see For a given out. value of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I honestly just post memes. <laughs> That's about it. I love memes, though. <laughs> um, also, you'll see our charity has a presence um, on social media. It's at LGBTYS on all the platforms. Uh, check out our website um, and follow us to uh, keep in touch with us and learn about what we do as we explore uh, digital youth work and gaming. Um, I'd like to give an amazing round of applause to our fantastic panel for today. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your Comic-Con.